and welcome to another Dividend Cafe. I am sitting in the New York office, uh, although tonight I will fly back to California and then fly back to New York on Sunday night. So kind of a, a lot of back and forth these days, but I love recording in the studio, whether it's California or New York. Uh, and I love recording in the studios much more than in a hotel room. Um, and I really love this week's Dividend Cafe. And uh, I'm going to, actually the written Dividend Cafe this week doesn't have a bunch of charts and graphs and things. Um, I, I just want you watching the video or you listening to the podcast to get a certain message out of what I have to say, which is something I began writing very early this morning, just finished moments ago. But I think it's one of the more evergreen principles, meaning just permanently applicable, a sort of universal um, truth in the message uh, that, that I am ever going to do in Dividend Cafe. Most of what we do, we intend to have some universality to it and, and permanence of application. Uh, but, you know, when some weeks are, are going granular into Saudi Arabia or the Fed or um, a new uh, convention of monetary policy, I recognize that those things may not seem as sort of permanently, universally applicable to the actions and thinking of an investor. But right now, there is a sense in which I, I'm not getting overwhelmed with feedback or comments. I think a lot of that might have to do with the fact that we write the DC today every day. So certain anxieties or pressures or, or whatnot that could bubble up for clients perhaps are preempted by just the ongoing communication that we do. Um, and also, I believe that some of it's a little skewed because People that are investors in the NASDAQ out there or were heavily overweighted to shiny object investing, they may be feeling a certain anxiety that perhaps clients of the Bonson Group are not feeling, which we, we've had a more positive year so far around the kind of fundamentals of what, how we invest and, and cyclically and, and so forth. There's been you know maybe an advantage there that has calmed people. But still, there is an anxiety in the air. I hear some of it, sometimes not even from clients. Um, and I think the anxiety is somewhat prominent um, in terms of this fear of uncertainty. And that word in particular, I'm, I'm hearing a lot and I'm hearing it applied to Russia, Ukraine, to the Fed, to China, to a lot of things that, that most certainly are uncertain. I mean, that, that, that's not really what I'm here to talk about today is by trying to put people's mind at ease about the particular uncertainties. What I want to do first is add to the list of uncertainties. I'll, I'll dig the ditch deeper if you want. If one is looking for things to feel anxious about, you don't have to limit your list to Russia and the Fed. I mean, geopolitically, I wrote a couple weeks ago about a total transformation in the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, we have no idea what this uh, um, authoritarian um, Putin is up to in Russia. Uh, we kind of know what he's up to. We don't know what the end game ends up being. Um, I think anyone who is paying attention, studying current events, understands that the Chinese Communist Party um, is, is, has aspirations that are in conflict with American interest. Um, there is a $30 trillion debt uh, sitting on the national credit card, and that debt is not going down. It is going higher. And all we ever talk about is the speed at which we grow the debt. Never any discussion about rectifying uh, other countries on earth have even worse debt predicaments. There is a valuation issue of the, uh, of risk assets, whether it's real estate or, or stocks that are trading. If you're being really kind of nice, they're, they're in kind of a higher range of historical valuation. If you're trying harder to, to get to a worse place, you could argue that they're outside of the bounds of historical valuation. Regardless, there, there's some froth in the way that risk assets are valued. That's indisputable. Uh, we know of high commodity prices. We know of incredible um, global um, uh, tensions. And we know of domestic political 
polarization, the partisan rancor that I think has become a cultural um, phenomena and not in a good way. And, and so I, I think you could look all over the map um, and find things that are very problematic. And you say there's just too much uncertainty, okay? And the only thing I guess that I want you to take away in the way I handicap these various uncertainties and distressful predicaments in which we find ourselves as a society, economically in most categories, some of those um, elements you could argue are more geopolitical or more cultural or more social. This is just not new. It simply is not unique historically. Uncertainty is the most certain thing in the history of investing. And what the specific uncertainty is, is the only variable. So it could very well have been Libya one moment and Egypt another moment in terms of uh, Middle Eastern tensions in the last 10, 20, and 30 years. And it could have been Russia here and, and Japan there and Germany there. You look to the various realities of just the 20th century and it is almost unfathomable how quickly history has changed in sometimes a matter of 10 years, sometimes for the worse, sometimes for the better. And yet that permanence in change being a dynamic of investing that has always been there. Um, are the specifics of a Fed being at the zero bound new? Well, actually, that specific isn't even new because we faced it after the financial crisis. They let the zero bound roll way too long. Then they tried to had to get off of it a bit. And uh, you had positive returns in the market from 2015 through 2019. Uh, now, I would argue they chickened out. They didn't go through to the point of full normalization. I don't think the Fed's out of the woods. Um, I don't think they're going to get to full normalization. But my point is there being this sort of new spirit of monetary experimentation is the uncertainty that I think will be the prominent one I deal with through, for the decades to come in my career. Um, but even if the Fed was not the major story, or at least people didn't perceive it to be the major story in other past decades of investing, um, there has been that theme, that thing that stuck out as a major uncertainty. And when you look at global tensions, we literally had two world wars in the first half of the 20th century. We literally were engaged in a four decade cold war with nuclear superpowers where a significant portion of the square footage of planet Earth was communist controlled. Um, now, all things being equal, I'd prefer to have no global tensions. I'd prefer to not be at war with Germany and Japan, and I'd prefer to also not be in conflict with Russia, with China, with Middle Eastern um, enemies and things of that nature. But see, I don't know what to say about that. If you're waiting for global peace and harmony to feel good about investing, I, you know, it's not going to happen. There will be a point at which peace and harmony comes, but it is on the other side of glory, my friends. And uh, I think everyone knows that, but I hope it's helpful to be reminded of it. I don't like what Russia has done. I do not like what Putin has done. I do not know how it's going to end. This Ukraine thing is a tragedy, but it, the notion of violence, of military escalation, of uncertainty, it's not new. The debt levels, I think 30 trillion is perverse. I think it represents stagnation and growth opportunity. I think the economy will do less great things than it is capable of doing if it weren't for the debt. And yet, I believe that when President Reagan left office, when I was in high school and we had 2.8 trillion of national debt and a bond yield, the 10 year, at 8.5%, People thought that was absolutely cataclysmic. And here we are 30 trillion later, and we have a bond yield of 2.5%. Now, I don't I, I can't tell you that we know how where things go with the debt and where things go with bond yields and so forth. 
I do know that markets have humbled people who have decided to persist in a, in a kind of atmosphere of uncertainty. Um, the valuation story, by the way, I'm not an index investor. We don't index client portfolios at the Bonson Group. We believe in active management. We believe in a better result. We believe in better mechanics and better risk management that come from dividend growth investing. It's what we do. But e even if one were indexing, I get the math that if you have a 20-year time horizon and you get to buy at an entry point of 16 times earnings instead of an entry point of 20 times earnings, I expect your long-term return to be higher. But I also think buying at 20 times will produce a better return than missing four or five years of returns altogether while you sit around waiting for something that may or may not ever happen. So I like to remedy the valuation issue with the way we invest money, but even in the world of index, in indexing. I, I think valuations, people could argue that the kind of historical averages of valuations have gone higher over years by the persistence of historical valuations. Um, I can tell you this, I look at like a perma bear guy like Jeremy Grantham, who I think is brilliant. I love reading his stuff. I'd rather be as smart as him than I am but I'd rather have our returns than his because they're just wrong constantly with these permanent bearish commentaries around valuation. And I think that that story matters and, and it can be remedied in the way in which someone takes a portfolio approach, but by allowing it to sideline someone or speak to an atmosphere of uncertainty, they miss the point. The point is we do not have the luxury of investing without uncertainty, geopolitically, economically, culturally. Um, I've made the comment before. I do think the current partisan rancor is worse than it's been in my lifetime. I was born in 1974. Um, I'll turn 48 next month, and I, and I don't believe it's been this bad in my lifetime. I can't really comment on 1968. Um, and, and I can only comment on the 1860s because of the just profundity of the historical moment. I'm quite comfortable saying that things are worse at Gettysburg than they are now. And as far as comparing it, what it is now to 1968, I, I, you know, I'm sure there's different arguments, maybe even a lot of overlap and commonality, you know. But I, I think there's a cyclical nature to it. I'm not, by the way... As convinced, I think there's a lot of fatigue with the partisan tribalization right now. When you get off of social media and cable news, I'm not sure that in our day-to-day -day lives it is as bad as it feels at times. But but it's bad and and so forth. And and the COVID moment did not help our societal cohesion and presidential cycles for a couple of periods now have not been healthy there. But I, I have no reason to believe that it can't the pendulum can't shift the other way. But do I think about um, the deepening divide between red and blue when I'm investing, I, I do not. I, I, that's just silliness, silliness. I want a healthier, more cohesive society, and I want a more liberal society that is free in the classical sense of the word and has more tolerance for disagreement. I don't understand the um, social ramifications that we're dealing with, but the investment ramifications are nil. So I believe the message for today is to be certain that there will be uncertainty. And if today it's Russia, Ukraine, Fed, valuation, political rancor, tomorrow most of those things will be different, but there will be something. And the same was true of yesterday and years ago and decades ago and so forth and so on. But what I believe in and what I want you to believe in is the capacity for humans to act to do incredible things that create investable, opportunistic, productive results. I favor a pro-productivity agenda. I favor pro-growth. I favor as few impediments to human action as possible. I favor the right alignment of incentives to get humans to do what I believe they were created to do. And I believe that those who have financial aspirations should tie the growth of their capital to human activity. That's my story. That's what we do at the Bonson Group. And I don't believe that uncertainties are going to prevent that 
They never have, and I don't believe they ever will. I hope this is helpful. Reach out with questions. Feel free to try to poke holes in the thesis. And in the meantime, just know that um, the world keeps on turning, as it always has, and we continue to look for the right opportunities um, to do what needs to be done on behalf of our clients. Thank you for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. Look forward to coming back to you next week. It'll be a Thursday Dividend Cafe because markets uh, and offices are closed on Friday in honor of Good Friday. Thank you for watching the Dividend Cafe.